anti-war activists who flee Russia find detention not freedom in U.S. And some barbed wires right there. Maria Shemiatina and husband Boris Shevchak reunite after his release from the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Detention in Pine Prairie. So this is Pine Prairie, Louisiana. They had fallen in love their first year in medical school in Russia, joined by their commitment to building a democracy in a country where any remaining hope of it was disappearing. When Russia pushed into Ukraine this year, Maria Shemiantina and Boris Shevchak, who had married and become practicing physicians, posted videos of the bloodshed and anti-war messages on local media. I call on Russians to see the truth to not believe the lies of the Russian media. Shemiatina29 wrote on Instagram. Her posts were, <laughs> were deleted by authorities again and again, she said, until her accounts were blocked. The police called her family in search of the couple who had gone into hiding. Certain that they were on the brink of being conscripted to serve as medics on the front lines or in prison for their political activity, the couple decided to flee. They managed to make it to Mexico in mid-April. Two weeks later, they drove to a U.S. port of entry, handed over their passports, and requested asylum expecting their first taste of true freedom. Instead, their hands were cuffed, their feet shackled, and they were flown to remote immigration detention centers in rural Louisiana. It would be six months before they would see each other again. Let me just stop there, you know. I see comments <laughs> all the time online about Biden's open border, you know. Biden's open border. Anybody who wants to come to America can just walk in. So these folks, these folks came in and they got handcuffed. So it's not really true that anybody who wants to come to America could just walk in, you know. That's really a bunch of baloney, you know. That area down there in the border, if you've ever been, and I've been because years ago I worked in California and I used to cross the border, like around uh, San Ysidro. Very, very harsh territory, desert-like. If you cross that area, you're in desert area and it's very, very um, open, you know. It's not like shrouded like um, like a forest where you can sneak through, where like uh, trees can cover you, and you can shade from the sun. No, it's nothing like that. You look at the grass, very brown, like the salt, very brown. So you you in the open if you come through, and all you really need really down there is like like devices that will show movement um you know they hook up they use te they can use technology and they can see people coming over and they can wait for them <laughs> instead of having a whole bunch of border guards you can just wait wait for these people because it's it's open it's not like in a forest where you can hide like like in like in vietnam for example in Vietnam, you know, Vietnam got all these dense forests. Hence, that's why they were using a Agent Orange to cut off the, f the foliage, like the green leaves and so forth, so they could see the enemies in the jungle. Well, yeah, there's no jungle 
down in the southern U.S. Mexican border. Nothing like that. It's open. You're coming through. The sun is going to beat down on you. So let me get right to the story. I thought when we left Russia, our suffering would be over. Chef Shock 28 said in an interview from the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Facility in Pine Prairie, Louisiana. I feel hopeless. As Russian President Vladimir Putin cracks down on dissidents and arrests drive dodgers, growing numbers of Russians are making their way across the U.S. southern border. But contrary to their expectations of asylum and freedom, many of them are being put into immigration detention centers that resemble prisons. Even before Russia's assault in Ukraine, anti-government activists had been pouring out of the country and seeking refuge in the United States. The exodus intensified after the war began in late February, reaching the highest tallies in recent history. In the 2022 fiscal year, 21,763 Russians were processed by U.S. authorities at the southern border compared with 467 in 2020. In October alone, 2,879 came. So they're there right there. Um, everyone who touches U.S. soil has the right to claim asylum, though it is granted only to those who can prove they were persecuted in their home country based on their race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or members in a particular social group. So again, these people flee. They were not really persecuted. They told the walls were closing in on them. You know, their accounts were closed. Right? What was that? Instagram or one of those they were using? So... That's not really persecution, <laughs> you know, closing your account. Like Facebook could close your account in America. They could close Instagram. They could close Twitter. Just ask Trump when he had his, his account closed right here in the United States. So that's not political persecution. Many asylum seekers are released and allowed to argue their cases later in the court. But thousands are sent to detention centers where it is difficult to secure lawyers and collect evidence. And the chances of winning asylum are extremely slim. ICE has not released statistics on the nationalities of migrants being held behind bars. But lawyers who work regularly with migrants say Russian asylum seekers appear to have been detained at relatively high rates in recent months sometimes with bonds set in excess of $30,000. Some Russians have remained incarcerated for months under conditions they describe as extremely harsh. Proportionately, compared to people from other countries, there are more Russians being sent to detention, said Savlana Kaff, a San Francisco-based immigration lawyer, who said, she has been flooded with requests for help. Like the young doctors who were held in Louisiana, many said they had come to the United States thinking they would be welcomed as allies in America's push for democracy in Russia and Ukraine. Olga Nikitina, who fled Russia with her husband after he was in prison, there multiple times, spent five months in the same facility as Shemiatina. The whole time I was there, they treated us like garbage, said Nikitina, 33. I called hotlines, but they did not help in any way. Her husband, Alexander Balashev, 33, was detained for four months at a facility in Batavia, New York where he says officers told him and others that they had no rights 
because they had entered the country illegally. Well, I don't know how they enter the country. <laughs> if you um, if you come to a point where there is um, no border control, then yeah, you enter the country illegally. Ivan Sokolovsky, 25, another activist, has been held at the Pine Prairie for seven months. He recently lost his asylum case and said he fears that he will be deported to his death. It would have been more humane to be shot dead at the border than to be held in prison so long, he said. Human rights groups have for years documented the prolonged confinement, medical negligence, and mistreatment of immigrant detainees, especially those housed in for-profit contract facilities like those at Pine Prairie and Basile, 30 miles away, where Shamiatina was held. Russian asylum seekers interviewed said they have been at the mercy of guards who treat them with indifference and not infrequent hostilities. So there's Alexander Boloshov and Olga Nikitona. My dad. ICE declined to discuss individual cases, but said in a statement that the agency was firmly committed to the health and welfare of all those in its custody. It said the agency regularly review its detention operations to make sure that non-citizens are treated humanely, protected from harm, provided appropriate medical and mental health care, and receive the rights and protections to which they are entitled. GEO Group, the private company that operates a network of immigration detention centers, including the ones in Louisiana, said its facilities provide round-the-clock access to medical care, a legal orientation program, and free telephone calls to lawyers. Chef Shark and Shemiatina have been increasingly concerned about corruption and crackdowns on public expression in Russia. They joined protests called by the opposition leader, Alexei Navalny, in the run-up to Putin's election to a fourth term in 2018, when the university threatened to withhold their degrees because of their activism, they continued to secretly donate money to Navalny's organization in the years before he was poisoned and imprisoned. We believe young people can make change, Shemiatina said. At the hospitals where they work, the couple faced repercussions for their political views. They had their salaries. They said their salaries were slashed, and after they refused to sign petitions and participate in demonstrations in support of Putin, when Russia invaded Ukraine in late February, the couple began posting photos and videos on Instagram and V contacted a Russian platform and learned that police were looking for them. As doctors were mobilized for the war effort, they decided they had to leave the country. <coughs> Unable to obtain visas to the European Union, <coughs> you have to say why, right? They followed the, <coughs> the route of other recent Russian dissidents flying to Mexico on April 13th. Two weeks later, in the city of Tijuana, they reached the U.S. border and requested protection. At the port of entry near San Diego, right, that's where, that's where I went down too, that I'm talking about, where you go by San, San Ysidro. At the port of entry near San Diego, where they were ordered to remove valuables, 
Chef Shark tucked their wedding bands into a compartment of his backpack. After six days in separate cold and windowless cells, they were flown to Louisiana on May 5th and placed in different centers. At the South, at the South Louisiana Ice Processing Center in Basil, Shemiatina counted 2,000 Russians in a dorm she shared with about 60 women in orange jumpsuits. After three weeks, she had her first court appearance over video with a judge thousands of miles away. The judge told her that she had illegally entered the country but could assemble evidence to support her claim for asylum. Shemiatina explained that all the evidence was in the cell phone and laptop that authorities had confiscated, including screenshots of her anti-war posts, a notice about the call-up of physicians, and evidence of threats she was receiving. At Pine Prairie, Chef Shuck went through similar motions. Still, at that point, he said, I was thinking it wouldn't be long until I saw my wife again. To pass the time and cheer up his wife, Chef Shuck wrote letters and sketched drawings of romantic scenes, a couple sitting side by side, gazing at a mountain or standing hand in hand by a river which he mailed to her after a detainee threatened violence against him and other Russians. Shavshad demanded they be moved. A guard handcuffed them during the transfer and knocked Shavshad to the floor, he said, causing him to injure his head on the concrete and his nose to bleed. I came to realize that I had left Russia for a place that was just like Russia, he said. Shashak went on a hunger strike. He fired off complaints to the Immigration Detention Ombudsman, Hotlines for Human Rights Group, and the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Finally, in early August, the couple made their way to the top of the wait list of ISLA, a non-profit immigrant aid organization in New Orleans. Their lawyer, Jessica Gutierrez filed request for the couple's release, noting that they were not a flight risk and had a sponsor to receive them. ICE responded that after review of all the relevant facts, it had determined that they could be released if each posted bonds in the amount of 15000 <laughs> But where would they find $30,000? By then, Shemiatina had begun experiencing excruciating pain in her pelvic area, a numbness on the left side of her body, but MRIs were inconclusive according to medical reports reviewed by the New York Times. On October 5th, she was found unconscious in her room and then began having seizures. She was taken by ambulance to a nearby hospital where doctors diagnosed her with an unspecified neurological problem. When she was unable to walk without assistance, Gutierrez demanded her immediate release from ICE custody to preserve her life. Instead, she was sent back to detention. On October 28, ICE agreed to lower the bond for the couple to 10000 each, money they still did not have. This is also senseless, Chef Shuck said in an interview, then looking pale and despondent. Yeah, it is. When you think about all the people who came in to Texas, that uh, the governor of Texas was shipping up to New York, those people didn't have any bond, you know, and they didn't have them detention. They were sent up to New York, and New York City uh, put them up in either hotels or uh, places they made for them. They're free. <laughs> Whereas these Russians, the ICE wants uh, ice them to part. First, it was 30000 for two of them. 
Now uh, 10,000 each, which is 20,000, which they don't have, you know. And by the way, um, doctors in Russia don't make a lot of money, you know. I read that a prostitute in, in Russia, like in Moscow, will make more money than a doctor. Even a taxi driver driving a cab makes more money than a doctor. So, you can imagine. And I think that's one of the reasons the, the, the U.S. Uh, is kind of like hesitant to grant these people asylum because many of them would, would like to get here. There was a lady I, I used to chat with, like, maybe going back 15 years ago from Moscow, Russia. And she wanted to come to the U.S. She had a boyfriend in Los Angeles. And she went to the U.S. Embassy like twice and applied, and she was denied. And then you, you read, and this was a lady I personally used to speak with. You know, not a story somebody told me, but somebody I used to chat with who had a boyfriend, she couldn't come here, and eventually he went, there to, he went there to meet her because it was easier for him to go to Russia than for her to come to America. So she met him. But still, she's in Russia today. That didn't work out. And then uh, because there are countless number of Russian women you see in these Roman sites who want to come here, and sometimes when they do come, you know, they find excuses and they end up leaving the man, the American man that they marry. So that's another sham. And also, some of them, like the article said, they've been coming before to the um, Mexican border. Because Mexico is very, very easy to come to Mexico. Mexico doesn't have a lot of fuss. You want to fly to Mexico, no matter what country you, you're from, they allow you in because they depend heavily on tourism too, so they don't care. So once you once you land for in Mexico, you make it up to the northern part of Mexico, and then you try to cross over into the U.S. Now some Russians... They could speak English well enough that they don't have like an accent, and they could dress up a way, you know, to come across the border. They, some of them have done that, because in the past, you don't really need any um, passport or ID. You can just you can just come up, show up at the border, and if you you sound American, you look American, you dress American. You wear a baseball cap or what have you, and they ask you what's your citizenship. They they allow you in because I was down there I think in maybe nineteen ninety ninety two, and I went with an American girlfriend, and she was drunk anyway. She drank tequila, and uh, the officer asked her what's your citizenship. And she told him, and he, back in those days, they didn't check any papers or anything like that. They let her in. <laughs> you know, they let her in. So, if the Russians were able to, like, speak English well enough, clear, they could get in, into the country, and be an illegal alien. So I'm pointing that out there. So... There was always an incentive for Russians to come to the United States because they make a lot more money here. Even even if they may be a doctor or what have you, like this couple, they would feel much better in the U.S. than the salaries they were making in Russia. So I should be more skeptical letting Russians in. So finally, a Russian dissident chef shock had met at the border. Balashov amassed the money to free Shemiatina. 
She traveled to New Orleans on November 6 to await her husband, wearing a brace to support her leg. Dan Garcia, a history professor at the State University of New York in Delhi and a volunteer for Freedom for Immigrants, which aids detained immigrants, had organized a fundraiser to pay Chef Shark's bond and fly the couple to New York. Community members volunteered to house and help them. These are incredible young people who fled because of their opposition to the regime, he said, and fell victim to our broken asylum system. And they repeat it right here. On November 8, Shemiatina climbed into a minivan and her lawyer at the wheel for the three-hour drive to meet her husband at Prime Pine Prairie. I'm more happy than on my wedding day, she declared. When Chef Shark emerged from the concertina ring facility, smiling broadly, he quickened his pace to reunite with his wife, who hobbled toward him. From his backpack, Chef Shark retrieved the wedding band he had hidden away six months earlier. He slipped it on Shemitina's finger. Now keep, keep in mind now, these people are only out on uh, bail. That doesn't mean they're granted asylum. Sooner or later, they're going to have to appear in court and go before an immigration judge and they're going to have to provide evidence to show that they were mistreated in a way or they were like political prisoners or their rights were violated because of their political thoughts or what have you in order to get asylum. And that's not that easy. It's not that easy at all. Now you may ask yourself, why are they giving doctors a hard time and people who come here, you know, across the border, women, children, and what have you, from southern Mexico are not having this hard time, you see? More than likely, those regular people could come here and assimilate and, and work and pay social security taxes or what have you than the doctors. To work as a doctor here is not that easy. You gotta go through training and you gotta pass the medical board exams. So, not because you're a doctor in Russia, that means you could come in and you can start working as a doctor. It doesn't work that way. And depending on the state, some states have certain requirements too. Even if you have a license, that you have to meet like certain certain criteria has to be met in order to practice medicine. And some may just not recognize the license over there. So you have to go back through the whole thing. So being a doctor, sure, it's nice to have a doctor or somebody who's educated come in. But that's not the end of the story, you see. And how likely would a doctor or two doctors feel working in um, in a restaurant as dishwashers? <laughs> that would make them too happy. 